Hello and welcome to another TLC Tutoring Company Accounting lesson. In this video, we will be going over how to convert cash basis accounting to accrual basis accounting with very particular scenarios. So in order to run through these different scenarios, it might be useful for you to pull up the practice worksheet that we have available. I will have a link to that in the description below. Also in that link, you will find some additional practice resources and quizzes that you can use to really make sure that you understand cash to accrual and accrual to cash conversions. So let's start with, with scenario number one. Here we have MB Athletics that reported the following balances at the end of the last two years for salaries and wages payable. And they tell us that during 2NEX4, MB Athletics paid $500,000 in salaries and wages. And they want us to find out Based on this amount that they paid and these balances, what was MB Athletics' accrual salaries and wages expense for the year? So essentially, we're converting this paid amount into accrual-based accounting expense. So in order to do this, there are a few different ways. Uh, there are quite a few textbooks who prefer to use formulas, but I think a really important way to learn how to do this uh, with a good understanding of accounting is to use T-accounts and or journal entries. So I'm probably going to be using this T account off to the right hand side, but I'll probably also be showing some journal entries as we go through as well. So taking a look at this first one, you are always going to want to be analyzing the account for which they give you the beginning and ending balance, right? So we're going to assume that all salaries and wages payments are flowing through this payable account first. So for this one, we are analyzing 20X4, so what we need is the beginning balance in 20x4, which is the ending of 20x3. So whatever you have at the end of 20x3 is what you have at the beginning of 20x4. Kind of think of it like years. So if it's December 31st, 2023, and I have $20,000 in an account the next day, on January 1st, 20X4, I'll have that same amount. So this 20,000 is the beginning balance and salaries and wages payable for 20X4. Now salaries and wages payable is a liability account and hopefully by now everyone's comfortable with the normal balances and accounts. Salaries and wages payable is a liability. So the normal balance is a credit. And if you're struggling with normal balances, I'll link to a helpful video in the description below as well. Uh, next, we need the ending balance. They ended the year with 28,000 in the account. Now, the next thing I usually recommend once you have your balances in place is to kind of analyze salaries and wages payable and ask yourself a few questions. I'm just going to kind of include some of this uh, talk down at the bottom here. Uh, let me change my text. So really something that you are, some questions that you're going to ask yourself um, would be, uh, what makes salaries and wages payable go up, right? And then also, what makes salaries and wages payable go down? And if you're very comfortable with these different types of accounts and what we're doing here, you would know that salaries and wages payable goes up whenever we have the expense and it goes down whenever we pay it. And off to the side here, I'm just going to show a quick little journal entry. So salaries and wages payable goes up when we credit it. So let me go ahead on this credit side. So salaries and wages payable is going up. And we have to ask ourselves, what makes salaries and wages payable go up? It would be the expense. Now we know from what we were doing before is that this salaries and wages expense is essentially what we are trying to solve for, right? So really once we solve for these unknowns, we will have our salaries and wages expense. So let's take a look at the second question. What makes salaries and wages payable go down? So let's analyze that. So what makes salaries and wages payable go down? Well, paying cash. So really, this is where this additional information is going to come in handy. They told us that we paid 
$500,000 in salaries and wages. So if they paid that, that means that cash is going down, which means that salaries and wages payable would be debited for that amount. And here's where knowing how it goes up and how it goes down is very important. So we know that we paid 500,000 in salaries and wages. Actually, let me give these some titles as well. So from this point, it's really just a question of solving for the unknown. We know that the amount that we credit to salaries and wages payable here is the amount of our missing expense. So we just have to solve for what's missing here. Now, in order to solve for this, there's a few different ways. I usually recommend just go ahead and do, you know, your, your whole algebraic equation. So for example, if you say uh, 20,000 uh, plus X, your unknown, minus your debit of 500,000 equals 28,000. So really you'll have this algebraic equation and you'll simply solve for X. So if we do that, go ahead and do the math now, 28,000, I'm gonna work backwards. That means that it should be 508,000 is our expensed amount. And you can even kind of move this forward just to make sure that you did it the right way. 20,000 plus 508,000 minus 500,000. Yes, that equals 28,000. So you know you did your math right. This is going to be your missing amount. And then let me even show you in our journal entries, if you credited wages and pay, wa wages, salaries and wages payable for 508,000, that means your salaries and wages expense will also be 508,000. And that's your missing expense that they are asking for here. That may have been a little confusing, so let's try another example. Here we have scenario number two, where they collected 2.1 million in cash, and they are telling us that at the beginning of the year they had 150,000 in accounts receivable, and at the end of the year they had 180,000. So we're seeing it written in a little bit of a different way, but they're still giving us the same components, really. They're giving us the beginning and ending balance in accounts receivable, we are trying to solve for accrual sales given cash sales collections, right? And again, we're going to have to make the same assumption as what we did before. We are going to assume that all of our sales are running through this accounts receivable account. So let's take a look at accounts receivable. Accounts receivable is an asset, so it has a normal debit balance. So this, uh, this time our beginning and ending balance will go on the debit side. Okay, and now ask yourselves, what makes accounts receivable go up, right? And in this case, for accounts receivable, we are going to be doing the same thing as before. Let me get some additional items here. I'm just going to copy what we did before and keep going with it. So what makes accounts receivable go up? And what makes accounts receivable go down? All right, so in order for accounts receivable to go up, that would be a debit. So when does accounts receivable increase? And that would be whenever we make a sale. Remember, we're making the assumption that sales will always flow through accounts receivable. And then when does accounts receivable go down? Well, whenever we collect cash on account. So here we have our scenarios, and now we can figure out is this third piece of information, the cash collected during the year, is this going to have to go on our debit side or credit side to help us plug? So if we collected cash of 2.1 million, that means accounts receivable must be credited for 2.1 million. So let's plug that in. And now, go ahead and put that in. Now, 
we can simply figure out what our accrual sales are for solving for that unknown. And same thing as before, if you wanted to write out an algebraic equation, 150,000 plus what? Minus 2.1 million equals 180,000, and then solve for x. Let's go ahead and do this. I'm going to work backwards for algebra. Let's see, 180,000. That's a negative, so I'll add it. And that's a positive, so I'll subtract it. 2.13 million is what we get for our accrual sales. And remember, don't be afraid to check your math. 150 plus 2.13 million minus 2.1 million does equal 180,000. Okay, one more. We have scenario number three, where we have MB Athletics that collected $13,000 cash for rent during the year. Now notice they're collecting cash. This means that they are the landlord, right? They also tell us that the company's unearned rent revenue decreased by 3,000 during the year. So they're being a little cruel to us in this example, but I wanna show you how we can use T accounts to still solve for this. Um, for those of you who are very familiar with cash flows, you might know that there's a little alternative way that we could solve if we really want to, but I still think we should stick with this T account method while we're getting comfortable. So I know that unearned rent revenue is a liability account, so it has a normal credit balance. So I'm going to make up my beginning and ending balances just to show that it decreased by 3000 So I'm just going to pretend that I started the year with 4000 and I ended the year with 1000 I'm being a little tricky here, right? So I'm showing that it decreased by $3,000 during the year. So in order to solve for this, again, we have to ask ourselves those same questions as before. What makes unearned rent revenue go up? And what makes unearned rent revenue go down? So let me go ahead and ask myself that question. All right, so unearned rent revenue goes up with a credit because it's a liability. And the only time when unearned rent revenue will typically be going up, generally, is when we're receiving cash. So whenever I collect cash, unearned rent revenue will go up. Now unearned rent revenue will then subsequently go down when I earn that rent. So I know that I'm going to be able to solve for the missing rent revenue by solving for this unearned rent revenue debit. However, they do tell us the amount of cash collected, right? They tell us that MB Athletics collected $13,000 cash for rent during the year. So I know that the cash I collected will be my credit to unearned rent revenue. And eventually, as you're getting comfortable with these, you'll start doing this a lot faster. So that will be a credit to unearned rent revenue for cash collected. Cash goes up, unearned rent revenue goes up. So now I simply have to solve for my unknown. Again, let's go ahead and do a formula. I'll go over here so we have more space. So uh, 4,000 plus 13,000 minus x, your unknown, equals 1,000. So here now you have to solve for this unknown, solve for your x, and see what you get. I see here that I have 4 plus 13, that's 17,000. So in order for me to go from 17,000 right here down to 1,000, how much must I be deducting? That must be my 16,000. Let's put in those labels. All right. And that's really it for these types of problems. Right now, I'm definitely doing it a very long way, and I'm showing you a few little tips and tricks that we could use in order to solve for these types of problems. But really, as you get more comfortable, you're going to find your own ways to kind of run through these a lot faster. As you're getting started, though, I highly recommend using a T account, and also it's very important that you're comfortable with what makes accounts increase and decrease. So it's good practice all around. If you want more practice, please be sure to see the link in the description. And until next time, happy studying. Good work.